and World Special. The makers of Laughter bring you a special comedy salute to Steve Allen on his 25th anniversary in television. Yes, welcome to... <laughs> Hi, host <hello>, Steve Arino. <laughs> Thank you for your very great reception, ladies and gentlemen. May I say that your applause has been recorded and will be sent to the less fortunate stars. <laughs> they uh, asked me to come here to say a couple of words about Steve Allen. How about tall and cheap? <laughs> but it's really a thrill for me to be here. In fact, it's more than a thrill, it's an inconvenience. <laughs> Uh, by me being here, I'm going to miss Gilligan's Island. <laughs> you know, uh, I've appeared at so many of these functions recently, you, uh, Josh, I'm talking, please. <laughs> you going to marry him, too? Uh, I was about to say, I, I've appeared at so many of these functions, it won't hurt him. <laughs> I was about to say, I'll get this out yet. I, I've appeared at so many of these functions. You run out of things to say. I think the folks on the dais will agree with me. T tonight, I feel like Jaja's next husband. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do, but how do you make it interesting? <laughs> Actually, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Uh, Actually, um, Actually, we're all happy to be here tonight to celebrate Steve Allen's 25th anniversary in television. And ladies and gentlemen, here's our guest of honor. Yes, old Four Eyes is back. <laughs> Steve Allen, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it. You can sit down. They're tired of you already. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just so you... Tonight, uh, Steve, I'm very happy to be here, and I think I speak for the dais. This uh, could be, tonight, the show of the year. And they just named a pizza parlor after your chances. Shaky. <laughs> <laughs> Look around, Steve. Look at this. This is your dais for the evening, huh? Gives you an idea of the kind of friends that Steve Allen has. Not one of them is working. <laughs> oh, by the way, they've asked me to make an announcement. Would you pardon me? Just a minute, I'll make an announcement. This show tonight is being transmitted by Telstar to our fighting men, the gas station owners. <laughs> hey, yes. That's a funny joke. I should have saved this one for a big dinner. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we 
two, three, four. As, um, I was just thinking, as we sit here, think of it. Three men have been in orbit for almost two months. There are strikes, picketing, unemployment, Watergate. The energy crisis is threatening the world. And we stop everything to come here and give a dinner for this Canoga Park Cole Porter. <laughs> Anyway, Steve, I'm proud to say, here we are on the full ABC network. Six stations. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, you don't know this, Steve, uh, but I must yes, say this to the does. audience. No, he doesn't, George. <laughs> but you'll get your chance to die. <laughs> that was George Burns, who was popular many years ago. Actually... The only reason, ladies and gentlemen, that we're honoring this aging Dick Cavett <laughs> is that ABC had to have something to separate the commercials. <laughs> and speaking of commercials, guess what's coming up next? did that in those days. Oh, before I go any further, you can sit down here. We've seen the dress. Before I go any further, I'd like to read a telegram from one of the alumni of the Steve Allen show. It's from Don Knotts. And it says, sorry, I can't be with you tonight. I don't know what I would have done without your strong support. I think of you every time I wear it. <laughs> But they say that behind every great man, there is a great woman whispering. <laughs> I just heard you whisper to him, Jan. I was just about to introduce you. Now, please, please. I'll, pick, I'll pull your wig off. <laughs> Jane Meadows, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If I've said anything to insult you, believe me. Jane Meadows. <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you, this is wonderful. Jane Meadows is certainly a lovely, charming, and talented lady in her own right. And uh, here's something that I know for a fact. Uh, as I come in here tonight, she's very upset. Her dressmaker is here and is wearing the same dress she has on. <laughs> and it looks better on him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Jane Meadows. Let's hear it, Miss Jane Meadows. And don't whisper when I'm on, please. <laughs> Thank you, Milton. And you know the dress would look adorable on you, too. <laughs> now, I know that there are going to be a lot of jokes about Steve tonight, but I really think that as his wife, I'm entitled to um, say something very important, and that is to emphasize that behind the mask of the clown and the baggy pants and all the crazy jokes that, you know, Steve's so famous for, you will find a very serious side to this man because Steve is a man of great dignity and uh, his concern for the welfare of the underprivileged is very well known. And I think that it's often in moments of great stress when you can tell the real measure of a man. Well, now I have a piece of film that I want you to see now. It's photographic evidence, you might say, of the basic seriousness and dignity of Steve Allen's mind. <laughs> the only thing is you're all Indian sportscaster. <laughs> Bringing you, how are you, the complete sports roundup from the world of sports for all you jerky sports out there in Sportsland. Well, what's new in sports? I'll tell you what's new. The 1958 ouch baseball season is getting in the way with the annual... <laughs> Good night, folks.
that one is good. I'm sorry. The annual spring training warm up. The big league teams are all at the spring training headquarters around the country. Let's see what's happening. <laughs> You're a better man than I am there. St. Petersburg, Florida. The New York Yankees are finally given trying to sign up the Yankee rookie holdout, Lefty Gerber. Lefty's been holding out since 1921. <laughs> now we're in trouble. All right. He is now continuing with the dignity of the evening. <laughs> Our next guests, ladies and gentlemen, are Dan Rowan and Dick Martin, two great straight men. <laughs> I, uh, I go way back with these guys when Dan was a used car salesman and Dick was a bartender. So when they decided to go in show business, the world lost a great thief and a hell of a drunk. <laughs> Gentlemen, the stars of Laugh In, which after five years was laughed out. <laughs> Dan Ron and Dick Martin. Let's hear it! great pleasure to be here tonight, especially to be first. Yeah. Because now you can't talk about what anybody else has done. You say hello to uh, Milton? Hello, Milton. <laughs> hello, dear. Nice hello, Steve. Nice, Jane. Hi, Jane. Hi, Jane. Does she look well tonight? She always looks well. Yeah. <laughs> this is the year of the roast on TV. That's There's been a lot of roasts, and we've been doing a lot of them. Yeah. Everyone's had Ralph Williams, Lyle Talbot, Rory Calvin. <laughs> we've been doing. <laughs> we get to do some of these, some of these bigger ones. I don't know why it is the year of the roast. Why is that? Uh, it's the, the year. Of the, well, uh, because of the energy crisis, that's why very few of them are well done. I think. That may be. <laughs> so busy doing the other roast that we it's really didn't have time to write anything specially for Steve. But we Steve, apologize. Steve is what they call an eclectic personality. I had no idea. Yes, well, that means he, he does a lot of different things and a lot of things appeal to him. So, uh, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of these roasts that you do a lot of time on and they cut out a lot of things that you do for one reason or another. So we've got a lot of things left over from the other roasts that we've done <laughs> that have been cut out. Some of those other roasts have never been on the air before. That's right. And uh, unless your producer is smarter than we think he is, they'll be on this time. <laughs> they, they might. They might be. <laughs> At, at that Mitzi Gaynor oh, host? Oh, Biggie, Biggie. Say hey, Mitzi. Yeah. Um, Bob, Bob Hope asked me to tell you that he can't be here tonight because he's having an emergency session, a cue card, an ad-lib cue card session with his writer. That's right. In case Dolores says, how are you, Bob? Yes. <laughs> then he's going to... I would stick him. Would okay. you want to save any of those? No. I would use... I was just I was dying. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Oh, yeah? <laughs> you sit next to Zsa Zsa. Yeah. Sitting next to Louie. Well, Zsa Zsa always, oh, always looks she's very, very, very nice. You know, she's just been announced as the latest winner of the Hugh O'Brien Acting Award. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than uh, Hugh O'Brien's ever done. That's <laughs> Steve, as we all know, was the originator of many things on television, notably the talk show, the late night talk show. He's responsible for most of them. Now we watch Johnny Carson. Yep. We spent many evenings watching Johnny Carson in bed at night. Yep. Last time was at the Knickerbocker Hotel. I, think. <laughs> I don't think particularly responsible for it. Actually, it's very tough to write a lot of unkind things about Steve that's Allen, the, and that's what problem. roasts are all about, because when they said, when you come down to a roast for Steve, he said, what can you say about Steve? You know, Everything you know about him is nice. Because he's such a kind, generous man. He's generous with himself. He's always been very kind to people in this business. He's helped a lot. A lot of us wouldn't be here on the dais tonight if it weren't for Steve. Right. We'd be home having a good time. <laughs> Kiss the guest of honor. We are back again, ladies and gentlemen. And now may I introduce two of Steve's greatest discoveries. You can't send away for teeth. <laughs> two 
his, <laughs> two of his greatest discoveries and two of his oldest and dearest friends. These two great talents have the happiest marriage in Hollywood. Edie Gourmet is so sentimental, she gives a going away party every time Steve takes out the garbage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here they are, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gomez. Let's hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, we're very happy to be here. I think probably Edie and I know Steve longer than anybody on the dais. Maybe not better, Jane, excuse me, but certainly longer. <laughs> and, uh... As a matter of fact, it was Steve Allen that introduced me to Edie, uh, but I decided to come tonight anyway. <laughs> and actually, if you really want to know the truth, it's Steve that really does take out the garbage. Isn't that true, Steve? That's not true. I mean, we've been married 16 years, and I've never once taken out the garbage. Well, you better get to it. It's piling up. <laughs> It really is nice to be back here. Yes, me too, Steve. You know, when I first came on The Tonight Show, the first thing that Steve Allen did was to introduce me to Steve Lawrence, and as a result, we got married and had two wonderful children. God knows what would have happened if he introduced me to Andy Williams. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, you know, Steve does so many things and does them well that uh, I don't know where he finds time to do it all. Uh, and he does like, uh, I know for a fact he does a million things. As I said, he writes and not only songs and books and things like that. But uh, we've, over the years, I guess we've sung more Steve Allen songs than just about anybody. Yes, I guess you might say that. After all, we had to keep our job. <laughs> I must say that uh, this song we originally introduced on the old Steve Allen Tonight Show. Steve wrote it and later became his theme. And I guess in a way ours too because we introduced it on records and we had a great deal of success with it. And for Edie and I, it really was the start of something big. My dear? My dear. <laughs> Hanson and Giselle McKenzie <laughs> in introducing, wake up, it's your time. 
in introducing our next speaker, I'll, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret as he's lighting a cigar. I'm the only one on this goes tonight that really knows how old George Burns really is. He's at the age now where his back goes out more than he does. <laughs> His idea of an exciting evening is to make an obscene phone call to Hermione Gingold. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my very dear friend, very dear friend, George Burns. That's here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to make sure of my cigars in my holder. At my age, that's exciting. <laughs> Milton, I want to thank you for that, for that, for that darling introduction. And it made me feel good. In fact, it made me feel young because your jokes are always older than I am. <laughs> and you know, Milton, I've watched you for a lot of years. And I noticed when you first started, everything you said had to get a laugh. I like the way you're working out there. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve has discovered a lot of people, but he doesn't know this, and this is true. I had a lot to do with discovering Steve Allen. I was at Jack Benny's house one night for dinner. About uh, 10 or 12 people there. And I had to go to the bathroom. There was a radio in the bathroom, and I, I turned it on. And <laughs> Steve Allen was on, and he was doing one of those late midnight talk shows, a, a local show. And uh, Bill Paley, the president of CBS, came in. I was just ready to leave, and he listened, and he said, who's that on radio? I says, that's Steve Allen. He's on your network. He says, that fellow's very good. He's funny. And from then on, Steve Allen's career went through the roof. So you see, if... I wasn't drinking beer that night. Steve never went to this guy. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Steve, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm sorry I didn't have more to say about you, but I really did. I had about six or seven minutes of all good Steve Allen jokes. And I met Milton at the club yesterday, you know? And I, I did the routine for him. And he said they were very, very funny jokes. He says, but George, if I were you, I wouldn't tell him because everybody on the dais is going to say the same thing. And Milton was right. They were very funny jokes because when Milton told him, every one of them got a laugh. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Good. Thank you. You didn't. Not funny. Thank you, George. Thank you. Stick around, George. Georgie Jessel is coming here soon to deliver a, a eulogy on your sex life. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, nice reception for your, your Frau, right? Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Jane Meadows. Once again, let's hear it. when uh, anything seems to go on television, and oh boy, is this the night. <laughs> but really and truly, things have become much freer in television, except that Steve has always maintained a reputation as a man who is really willing to hold the line. He feels, and I agree with him, that you don't have to be dirty to get a laugh. Yeah. Now really, that's true. Really, and I think it is very interesting in this connection to show now to you a typical ad-lib interview from one of Steve's old television shows. Now, I have to explain that as this scene starts, Steve had just been introduced to a very beautiful girl, Eileen O'Neill, who was Miss Pear. And that means that Miss Pear, yes, Edie, Miss Pear, was sent over to Steve's show by the National Association of Pear Growers or something like that to um, interest people in eating pears on television. She brought Steve a Roman toga to wear, and the whole scene that you will now see is completely ad lib. Steve had no idea what Miss Pear was going to say or do. And notice, if you will, this man's basic decency and sense of what constitutes wholesome family entertainment on television. The film, please. I want you to know my wife is backstage. <laughs> this is 
is not a, uh, a fake book, folks. It really is National Pear Week, and this, uh, this Diane of the uh, pear sauce is really, you know, serious about this. What have we here, my dear? This is a pear. This is a pear. Yes. This is birth, this is death, this is infinity. <laughs> What would constitute an attack? It would be similar to... You mean going like, yeah. Something like that or, or the way you would eat an ear of corn. I it, see. You have to be gentle and cool it, right? Yes. Because when you finally finish and you really savor every bite, all you have left is just a beautiful memory. An yeah. unforgettable memory and an empty hand. And can you realize how important this is? How long have we had this job? I think I just got fired. <laughs> no, you're making pears seem very romantic. No, they are. <laughs> Do you know that you will never know this? Pears date back to the very ancient Stone Age men. I think it was rather hard. <laughs> and they use them as food. Food? Mm -hmm. That's okay. a stupid thing to use. <laughs> when you can be doing this with them. <laughs> then Steve, later on the Greeks came on. Oh. They completely revived the use of the pair. Good for the Greeks. Good for the Greeks. Well, one pair, Steve, contains only 100 calories. Oh. And then two pairs must contain two. <laughs> I could go on like that all night. Ask me what eight pairs contain. 800 calories. Although altogether there are 850 types and varieties of pears at the present <laughs> there are three main varieties. Three main varieties, and one of those, my dear? Mm. Yeah, the Anjo. The Anjo. The Bosque. The Bosque. And the Comis. And the Comis. Yes. And there's quite a difference in the three different varieties. You're telling me. <laughs> The main difference being in the first pair mentioned. Gancho? Its shape, yes, correct. Its shape is oval. Oval. Yes. Crazy. It tastes spicy. Spicy. Sweet. Wild. And savory. And that is crazy. Crazy. Let's call a bunch of them up right now. <laughs> and the second type of pair. Let's get a box of pears and go over to PJ's. What do you think? <laughs> and the second type of pear has a long, thin neck. The second type of pear has a long, thin neck. neck yes, it tapers. Oh, tapers yeah, I'll bet you. Now, the third type of pear Gosh. is the largest pear of all. <laughs>
Here we are. We're back again. And just look at all the glamour stars we have here tonight. Zsa Gabor, to name three. <laughs> Our next guest... Yes? Uh, ...is also a graduate of the Steve Allen Show. See, nobody flunked. <laughs> This gentleman is now seen on every variety show as one of the real powerhouse comedians. He's doing so good now that he wears a medal around his neck that says, I am a celebrity. In case of an accident, please notify Rona Barrett. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorites, and I'm sure he's his. Uh, he's yours. <laughs> Tim Conway. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> but uh, I was in Cleveland, and I had to be discovered, so uh, I called uh, out here in the Yellow Pages under Get In Show Business, <laughs> and uh, they're listed alphabetically of people who discover you out here, and uh, the, the, the first uh, number was busy. <laughs> but oddly enough, uh, if it had answered, uh, I would have been discovered by Gina Lola Brigida. <laughs> Instead, uh, Steve actually had discovered me. Now, Steve has never taken credit for anybody that he discovers. I mean, he always says, well, they had their own talent anyway uh, when he's on the air. However, <laughs> in real life, you have a penalty to pay after he does discover you because he wants to hang around with you. <laughs> So while I was in Vegas, <laughs> I walked up to a guy in the street and I said, what do you think of Steve Allen? And this guy in Vegas said to me, you know Bob Hope <laughs> once said of Steve Allen, he's the Adlai Stevenson of show business. But this guy said in Vegas, that he would rather think of Steve Allen as the Henny Youngman of politics. <laughs> is what this guy in Vegas Is said it too to late me. to get the guy from Vegas on the show? I'm proud to have worked with Steve, is what I said to this guy in Vegas. Because I said, Steve is a man who has come up from nothing and brought it with him. <laughs> has always looked at comedy intellectually, as we were talking with Milt a little earlier. I don't know Milt, but it says we were talking together. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> you know, a lot of comedians will do anything for a laugh, but not Steve. He's always been known for his sharp wit. <laughs> And as, for instance, a lot of guys will put on a wig and a funny dress just to get a laugh. Oh, sorry. Nothing. Didn't mean anything, Milton. I know it. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Milton was serious. We, uh, <laughs> but I know that Steve has always been a very intellectual comic, and we'd like to kind of have you take a look at a little piece of film now here to just see how intellectually comedic he was now. <laughs> you tigers out there? <laughs> How are you tigers back there? <laughs> I'm more worried about you tigers back there than I am about you tigers up there. <laughs> but a tiger's a tiger. Ladies and gentlemen, in all fairness to our guest of honor, Steve Allen, I think we should examine the man. And this man should have been examined years ago. <laughs> I have uh, done, he doesn't know that, but I have done a lot of research on Steve Allen's entire career. Took about three minutes. 
So would you let me read it to you? Certainly. And I know him, I think, better than anyone, because I babysit it for him when he was... No kidding. May I go back? I got this out of the annals of the history of the uh, research. Steve Allen was born at home. When his mother took a look at him, she went to the hospital. <laughs> his mother was Belle Montrose, a great comedian, and his father, Billy Allen, was her straight man. True? Yeah. At birth, Steve weighed 12 pounds. His tongue weighed nine. <laughs> Alan had a very strange babyhood. He always had a feeling his parents didn't like him. Little things like the first rattle they gave him, they had a snake attached to it. <laughs> Steve Allen's life at home wasn't easy. His Aunt Mag, true? Mm -hmm. His Aunt Mag would often say to him, Steve, never take candy from a stranger unless he offers you a ride. <laughs> began to get the feeling that he wasn't wanted. Every day his parents did subtle things like wrapping Steve's lunch in a road map. <laughs> Little hints like when he went on the roller coaster, his folks made him a promise that he asked him, the hell with it, the next one. <laughs> What's the difference? It's not mine anyway. <laughs> By the time... <laughs> Steve knew what he wanted, and he followed his parents' footsteps. So he got an act together, started playing small theaters, and pretty soon, Steve was really stepping high. When you followed Fink's mules, you had to step high. <laughs> then in 1942, Steve Allen turned, in, turned to broadcasting, because a talent scout had told him they had a face that was perfect for radio. <laughs> he worked on the Flash Gordon program, but the show was canceled when they found out what Gordon was flashing. <laughs> Steve's incredible. Steve Allen, are you going to listen? You're going to laugh. Steve, <laughs> Steve's incredible creativity then led him into songwriting, where he composed as many as three to four songs a day, songs never to be remembered. <laughs> like, songs like, Everybody Loves My Baby, as soon as I leave the house. <laughs> or I stole her bra and left her flat. <laughs> the things we did last summer, I took shots for all winter long. <laughs> the old solo, I'm just wild about Harry and Jane's concerned about me. <laughs> One of his biggest hits were if you were the only girl in the world, you could name your own price. <laughs> Joe Solo, the ever popular Remember Pearl Harbor. Now, I don't say that's thrilling, but he wrote it in 1938. <laughs> so now Steve Allen's career was zooming, and he was picked by Universal Studios to make a movie on the life of Benny Goodman. This was his big chance. For the first six weeks, he had to study the clarinet, then for the next six weeks, he took lessons in looking Jewish. <laughs> uh, they speak about you. It says, it's the truth. Steve Allen was a great crusader. For years, he had worked to ban the bomb. Then he did the Benny Goodman movie, and he bombed the band. <laughs> and now, we come to the most important event in Steve's life. He met his lovely bride-to-be, Jane Meadows. They were introduced by a mutual friend, a bellhop. <laughs> Steve, at the very zenith of your career, we salute you on your 25th anniversary in television, and with your great talents, creativity, driving energy, and ambition, you could have been a success in any business you cared to. Why you chose to louse up television, I don't even know. Bless you, and thank you very much, Steve Allen. Thank you. Again, Miss Jane Meadows. <laughs> okay, Jane, that's the third time you've stood up. That's right. It must be tough on your pantyhose. <laughs> well, what do I care? They're yours. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, 
Well, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know how you can really tell about a great man? Oh. By seeing how all the people who work for him really feel about him. Now, anybody can hire a press agent to tell you, oh, they can make you feel that, you know, you're a really great person and you're a humanitarian. But it's the people who work for a man who are the ones who can really tell you how he ranks as a human being. Yeah. And guess what? Guess what? I have another piece of film for you now which demonstrates just what kind of affection Steve's employees really have for him. May we have the film, please, in the booth? <coughs> oh, I'm supposed to go home. Oh. Oh. Really? All right, I'll go over there and, and see what happens. But remember, I'm taking down names, staff. <laughs> Like this? That's fine, Steve. Now listen, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just a moment, just a moment. I'd like to dictate a memo. How's the lighting on me? Man first steps on the moon. Thanks a lot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the, uh, also from Steve's original Tonight Show, seems very strange for me to say original. <laughs> Here's another graduate, and perhaps the valedictorian of the Steve Allen School of Comedy. This gentleman is known as a comedian's comedian, which means about ten guys understand what this nut is doing. <laughs> Louis Nye is to comedy what Ernest Borgnine is to tap dancing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the great Louis Nye. Thank you. I'm very proud. P-R-O, I'm proud. Proud to share the dais with my dear friend Steve Allen. Incidentally, Steve, I love your new mustache. Just love that fun growth thing. You look like a gigolo in a convalescent tone. <laughs> coming up to me, Steve. Yeah. They always come up and they say, Louie, what is Steve Allen really like? And I always say he's like a hip Regis Philbin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steve, we really go back a long way. Those are only days of television. Forgive me for getting dramatic. <laughs> In those days, Steve, you weren't afraid of anything. Do you realize that? A tall, skinny kid standing up there. You were young and vital. And when we did a show, there was no tape and no retakes. You walked out in front of that live camera, 
smiling and young and happy and said, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And then you looked down and your fly was open. <laughs> Now in closing, may I have some music, please? Just a little music in the background. Nothing that Steve wrote, please. It's too soon after dinner. Steve and I have been working together for 20 years. He's my good friend, and I owe a great deal to this fellow because if it weren't for this man, I might have had to go through life always saying, Hi ho, Seymour. <laughs> It is performers like Louis Nye that give Derwood Kirby the courage to stay in show business. <laughs> well, now, one of the great comedic talents in our business, who I have also seen play many serious dramatic parts. Unfortunately, it happened while he was doing comedy. <laughs> takes show business seriously. Now, this is honest. He's dedicated, he's involved, he's committed. At least he should be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my favorite... Um, <laughs> let's hear it for Jack Carter, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Steve, this is not one of the biggies. This is not... <laughs> You had to blow your whole life on this stupid evening, right? <laughs> Look at this. Not even any food, no tables, and a rented audience. <laughs> but what a night this is. Milton Pearl toasting this beautiful dinner, and we're all gathered here to pay tribute to the one and only Steve Allen and see the two and only Georgia Gabor. <laughs> You look wonderful, darling. You're, incidentally, because Georgia was going to be on, she demanded and insisted that she be the only woman up on the dais. So tonight, the part of Jane Meadows is being played by Jim Bailey. <laughs> oh, what a night. All dear good friends, Rowan and Martin, my buddies, they're beautiful. And after all these years, they finally found their niche in show business, and they're doing what they do best, laying off. <laughs> George Burns. It's good to hear see George Burns here in person instead of Rich Little. <laughs> God bless George Burns. I love him. He's really beautiful. You know, he was born Nat Birnbaum, and he died about an hour ago. <laughs> He's beautiful. Loves to sing all his old songs. Oh, who's he do? Oh, he knows verses to 800 songs. He never gets to the chorus. He falls asleep. <laughs> He loves the comics, hangs around with Jan Murray, with Burl. He would rather get a laugh than have a hit record. And lately, he hasn't had either one. <laughs> and Edie, she's beautiful. Edie's Sephardic, you know. She's a Spanish Jew. Sort of a hacienta. <laughs> and Milton always invites all the comedians to Hillcrest to play golf with them and to have lunch. You ever see Milton pick up a check? Yeah! <laughs> and then he goes out to play golf, and he's a hypochondriac. 98 degrees, he wears an overcoat, galoshes, and earmuffs. And when you swing the club, he complains of a draft. And cheap, a 50-cent ball. He goes in the lake after it. He walked in the lake, went in over his head. All of us left with his hands sticking out, groping for help. One caddy turned to us and said, I think he wants a five iron. God bless you. There's only one Milton Burrow. He is a giant. He's an institution. Milton Burrow is a monument. And you know what pigeons do to monuments. <laughs> but back to our guest of dishonor, this malfunction here. <laughs> this dull Gene Rayburn, <laughs> creator of I've Got a Secret, which is the story of his career. <laughs> what is your secret anyway, Steve? What business are you in? <laughs> I mean, how can a 67-year-old man run around with dyed hair? Hokey mustache and trick or treat glasses and play howdy doody all the time. <laughs> Do 
he wrote a play, you know, The Wake. I think we're sitting at it tonight. <laughs> man has done everything. He wrote plays, that didn't work. He wrote books, that didn't work. He plays piano, that doesn't work. He married Jane Meadows, now she doesn't work. <laughs> but truly, it's nice to be here for Steve. I've known him many years, I've worked with him, and, and he's had many tributes and many honors and many testimonials and many, many great, great honors paid to him. But tonight, we're here to get Steve what he truly needs. A job. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to our guest of honor. Steve, this is a very, very important evening for all of us. I think we'll all join in what I'm saying, and we're all very thrilled that we could share your 25th anniversary of, in television with you tonight. And please, Steve. I'd like to introduce our guest of honor, who bought Polaroid at 12. <laughs> Steve Allen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I shouldn't have touched these that made a loud noise. I figure if I don't get a laugh, I can knit something, you know. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean that. Anyway, as a matter of fact, Milton is right. I did buy Polaroid at 12. Unfortunately, like an idiot at 12.30, I sold it. You know. <laughs> what is this, Steve uh, Lawrence? What? Sorry to interrupt, but you remember back on, the old, on your old Tonight Show? Yeah. Whenever we were running a little late, you would always come over to Dee Dee and me and say, I'm sorry, kids, but we're running a little late. Your song is cut. Yeah. I don't know how to tell you this, but we're running a little late, and your monologue is cut. <laughs> oh, yeah? I <laughs> will use that line all night. Hey, I just got a great idea. I could save time at my funeral by replaying this tape. <laughs> this is it. This is it. But this is such a beautiful evening. Even the stage is very interestingly designed and, and constructed. Could we have a real wide shot for for just one minute? Show the whole stage with your cameras. Just whatever your camera is back there. Could you just... Good. From this, from the front, this stage looks like an Edsel. <laughs> well, anyway, that's how you may come back then. If you want to, I mean. <laughs> Milton, you were never funnier. And it's a shame. <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, I knew I was going to get a chance to uh, nail all you guys tonight, so I've been keeping a file on you. It's a nail file. <laughs> That's my kind of a joke. And I'll show you where we're in. Uh, by the way, Milton, while you're on the air here tonight, where's Ruth? Ruth? Yes. She's home. She's home? Yeah. <laughs> you have just witnessed a scene from the new movie titled Fat Chance. <laughs> There's been a number of references this evening to the fact that I discovered a lot of now famous entertainers and gave them their start. You've been told, for example, that I discovered uh, Steve Lawrence and Evie Gourmet, and that's true, I did. I discovered them in the backseat of a car. <laughs> but it's great to, uh... <laughs> it's great to see so many old friends here this evening. Uh, it reminds me, seriously and understandably enough, of the old days on the original Tonight Show. And it doesn't seem so long ago. Steve Lawrence, uh, Louie and I, and I used to hang around together a lot. But you know, even then, if I may speak very frankly, Louie was kind of weird. <laughs> because whenever we would go out together, I would take Jane, Steve would take Edie, and Louie would take Kale Pectate. <laughs> And I think in those days, if, again, if I may be very honest and frank, Louie Louis used to drink quite a bit. Now he doesn't, but in those days he did. I remember the final night. Remember, Steve? Yeah. The, guy, the big final party. We had a big wild party the last night of The Tonight Show. And the last thing I can remember about that party is that Louie walked into a grandfather's clock and tried to call up his wife. <laughs> <laughs> and he got an answer. <laughs> but, uh, 
No, Steve, she, she wouldn't give him the right time either. I'd rather die by myself, Steve. But I, I really do feel a sense of pride. I'm in no way responsible for Steve Needy's talent, but they, I feel a kind of a paternal pride in them. They, they, they are brilliantly talented, and they look so marvelous together. Uh, they look marvelous and trim today, but uh, to tell you the truth, in the old days, they used to have a weight problem. They couldn't wait. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's true. Steve... <laughs> Steve has taken off a lot of weight since the old days. He used to be chubby, but tonight, look at him. He's slim as an eel. And, Steve, you are a slim eel. I want you to know. <laughs> In those days, Steve, I'll tell you the truth. I thought you looked a lot... <laughs> I thought in those days that you looked a lot like Van Johnson. From the front, you looked like a Johnson, and from the back, you looked like a Van. <laughs> now, let's see who else we had to talk about. Oh, yes. <laughs> Take Tim Conway, please. <laughs> Tim Conway, it's interesting how people project an image. Tim Conway plays a bumbling, inept dumbbell. And why not? <laughs> Tim is not the smartest man in the world. I mean, you could tell that. <laughs> He's adorable, but he is not very smart. Tim's bright idea for a way to help with the energy crisis is we should all drive at night with our lights off. <laughs> I don't want to come right out and say he's dumb. There's any young man tonight. But actually, Tim Conway thought that The Exorcist was the life story of Jack LaLanne. <laughs> Anyway, he's, he's beautiful. And Dick and Dan, it was awfully nice of you to, uh, to be here tonight. You know, some people say, I don't know if there's anything to this theory, but some people say that all the really great comedians are Jewish. And Rowan and Martin, you have certainly proved that tonight. <laughs> and Jaja, <Georgia. laughs> honest to God, Marcel Marceau tells a better joke. I'll tell you the truth. Jack Carter, some comedians are bad, but you're an exception. You're exceptionally bad. <laughs> well, I did see your last show on TV, Jack. I At least I hope so. so. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Milton mentioned it may be cut out of the tape, but Milton mentioned that I eat organic foods, and I, I do, and I'm proud of it. As a matter of fact, just this morning, I had breakfast with Ewell Gibbons. He ate my glasses. <laughs> And Jane, sweetheart, I'd like to thank you for those very embarrassing film clips you, uh, you dug up. But I must say, uh, I'm not going to do jokes about Jane. She's a very thoughtful wife. You know what she gave me for Father's Day? What? <laughs> the bills for Mother's Day. <laughs> but uh, Milton was mentioning earlier during one of the commercials how humor has changed in the past 25 years. And, and you can see the change. Uh, <laughs> the show started 23 years ago. I know. <laughs> I mean, right in the middle of his act, Jack Carter changed style several times. But I don't know where, seriously, I don't know where they draw the line anymore. I mean, Broadway and Hollywood have gone overboard altogether. Nowadays, they're making movies about wife swappers and swingers and, and uh, lesbians and, and demons and, and weirdos. It's actually gotten so bad, I was afraid to take my kids to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> Sounded dirty to me. I was kind enough to, uh, to say a, a, a complimentary uh, word, and I'm going to, uh, to pay him the same uh, kind of attention because uh, Milton is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Uh, that's an easy thing to say, but I want to emphasize I'm not saying it casually. Uh, Milton did, indeed, babysit for me when I was just an infant, and he was about seven or eight or whatever he was at the time. And... Uh, as a matter of fact, when my mother, Belmontros, whom you mentioned a little, when my mother passed away just a few years ago, Milton Burrow was one of her pallbearers. It was very nice of you. So, uh, in closing, uh, 25 years ago, perhaps for having committed serious offenses... Aren't you going to mention me? I'm a <laughs> George, George Burns says, aren't you going to mention me? All right, George. I, did, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I, you, you lied when you said you were the only one who knows how old George is. I am actually the only one who knows how old he is. How old? 
I counted the rings under his eyes. That's how I... I'm sorry you brought that up, George. <laughs> 25 years ago, as I was saying, for, uh, for having committed uh, serious offenses in radio, I was sentenced to 25 years in television. And I have now served that sentence with no time at off, uh, no time at all off for good behavior or for good diction. <laughs> but it's been a very interesting 25 years. And you know, Milton and, and George Burns and, and Ed Sullivan and the other pioneers of television, each has, has lasted uh, through that quarter century in his own way. Ed Sullivan did one show for 20 years. I did about 20 shows, some of which lasted one year. <laughs> but as I look back over the last quarter century of the TV rating wars, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm a little bit puzzled uh, in the way by the fact that I'm still working when some people with far greater talent uh, weren't around that long. I feel a little bit like the cardinal in France uh, who was asked what he had done during the French Revolution. His answer, as some of you may know, was, I survived. <laughs> and it is, dear friends, such as all of you and all of you out there who have made that survival such a pleasure. Thank you very much. David Steinberg is host as Elliot Gould, Dean Hackman, and other Hollywood personalities give an insider's view of movie making on Movies, Movies, Movies on ABC's Wide World Special tomorrow night.